together to discuss European issues. This open meeting has been organised by Salisbury for Europe, an organisation which has around 700 supporters locally, which is quite a number. Salisbury for Europe is a branch of the European movement and part of the Wiltshire Alliance for Europe. Salisbury for Europe is apolitical. On this stage at the moment, you have a Green Party member, a Conservative Party member, and a Labour Party member. And I'll let you decide who should be. But there's a clue in front of me. <laughs> uh, but before we start, I'd like to take a few minutes to reflect on the Russian invasion of the democratic European nation of Ukraine. And I think it's worth just repeating that and thinking about each, each individual word. The Russian invasion of the democratic European nation of Ukraine. And of course we think, we think hard of the people of Ukraine with whom we stand in total solidarity. And I'd just like to take a few moments to reflect on Ukraine and its people. When we planned this evening, the idea almost six years after the Brexit vote, it was to discuss a wide-ranging discussion where as a country we find ourselves economically, socially, culturally, emotionally, in terms of how we stand within Europe. Are we building back better? How do we build closer relationships with our European neighbours? Rejoining the single market? What possible steps and conditions to rejoin the European Union? To explore the big ideas around Europe. And this remains the agenda. But of course the invasion of Ukraine, a sovereign European nation, has brought sharp focus into our position and how we relate to Europe our shared European values, and of course the defence of democracy and freedom. So our discussion will be broad. <coughs> Before I introduce our speakers, as a few housekeeping points, uh, fire escapes, there, 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 and there is no fire procedure planned. No, um, what's the word? Yeah, practice. practice. No practice planned. Toilets, again through that door and turn right. Masks are optional. We are filming, and the film will be on YouTube later in the week. And there will be a retiring collection for Hope and Homes for Children, and more about that later. And some gentle reminders. <clears throat> we are not here to rerun the arguments around the referendum, or to bandy about statistics. Questions or comments later should be short and relevant, please. Common courtesy and politeness is to be maintained at all times, and the meeting will finish at 8.30 promptly. <coughs> to our speakers. Our principal speaker is Robert, Robert Key, and for many of you, he needs no introduction. But for those who are less familiar with Robert, he served as the Salisbury MP for 27 years, was educated locally at the Cathedral School, Sherborne and then Cambridge, became a teacher until being elected to Parliament as the MP for Salisbury in 1983, until he stood down in 2010. After his election in uh, 1983, he became the Parliamentary Private Secretary to Edward Heath, the former Prime Minister. Rob also held a number of senior roles in government, including Minister for Local Government Finance, Housing and Inner Cities, National Heritage and Transport. And he also served on the House of Commons Select Committees for Education, Science and Technology, Information and Defence. The platform will be shared by our facilitator, Adrian Cook, as ex-chair of Salisbury for Europe, who has held various academic positions, including at Wye College, Imperial College and more recently at Kingston University. Adrian's background is in Earth Sciences and he still teaches in adult education. Locally he is a trustee for the Harmon Water Meadows Trust. He write, regularly writes for the West of England Byways. 
I am also extremely pleased to welcome Olga and Taras Cott, who are sitting in the front row at the moment. And we will... <laughs> Olga and Taras live locally, but are Ukrainian citizens and with families still in the Ukraine, and who are now very active in the humanitarian aid effort. So, the format. Robert will start with his personal reflections and thoughts on Europe, facilitated by Hadrian. After about half an hour, they will be joined by Olga and Tess <coughs> to have a discussion about the situation in Ukraine. The second half of the event will be a question and answer session and obviously we're welcoming questions and comments from the floor at that point. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel. Yes, I am a Conservative. I'm a paid-up member. Because um, I'm not a designer. I was never going to tear up my membership card in a huff because I didn't like things. Well, I don't. Things. I find it very hard indeed, but I am a Conservative by, by conviction, since I was a student. Um, and I'm not going lightly, though I really don't recognise the party that now runs the government. Never mind. All the views I express are my own. Nobody is paying me to say anything. I have no other interests to declare. I'm here really on a non-party basis because I was invited by Rick and Salisbury to Europe. Um, and also because I am a freeman of the city of Salisbury, a rare honour. And I believe very much in expressing my views openly uh, in the interests, as I believe it, of Salisbury. Let me start by saying, we're all Europeans. What does it mean? Well, of course, statistics will tell you anything you'd like. But there are some things that are fact. Uh, for example, your DNA. I dare say some of you, like me, have uh, had your DNA tested. And this is, uh, this is my result. Um, and I, I, I have no reason to disbelieve it. It sounds right, according to my family history. It says I'm 68% Anglo-Saxon, 20% Viking. 7% Scot and 5% Welsh. I think that's about right. And I, I defy anyone to say that they're 100% Anglo Saxon or 100% anything else they live in this country. So let's get this clear. Um, test your DNA next time someone challenges you about whether or not you're a European. George Bernard Shaw said there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. I learnt that very early on when I was reading economics at Cambridge. And I am by nature very sceptical of the statistics. I also um, admire Newton's third law of motion. For every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so the hammer and tongs we went through six years ago over the referendum shouldn't have surprised anybody. That's just how it was. But as Rick has already said, there's really no point in wasting time and energy rerunning an argument that went on six years ago. I certainly will never, to my dying day, be anything other than a Eurofile. I am a Remainer. I will always be a Remainer. I will always be a European. I think it is one of the stupidest decisions we ever made as a country, certainly in my lifetime. However, we have to move on. And as the title of this talk suggests, we've been at it now for five years after the referendum. And are we building back better? Well, the answer is no, of course. Um, have we got Brexit done? No, the government has not got Brexit done. We have massive open wounds still. Northern Ireland Protocol, for example trade negotiations with nations all over the world, Honda in Swindon up the road, leaving the country, farmers sold out to Australia. The USA has said no, they won't do a trade deal with us. I thought we had a special relationship. 
So just look at the statistics, be sceptical, challenge them all, go to some of the authoritative sources of information, like uh, BBC, the BBC check uh, system, it's very good. So, of course, as the uh, Office of National Statistics, uh, I regret to say that in the last 18 months or so, um, I have found myself not believing a word any government minister says uh, without checking it out. What a terrible thing to say. There is a huge amount of unfinished business. I always said it would take 10 years before we settled down to the new system. But something has happened. There are new issues, massive new issues, cropping up all the time. That is one of the exciting things about being a member of the United Kingdom, incidentally. Um, everything changes according to society. We don't have a written constitution. We don't have codified laws. Uh, we, we are better than that. We're more flexible because that is the nature of being really awkward Brits. We don't like being put into little cubby holes. We're not <coughs> building back better. We're not taking back control. Uh, we have awful crisis in this country now, brought on not just the fault of the government, I'm not blaming them at all, but for example, energy. Now, <coughs> energy crisis. About 25 years ago, I was a shadow energy minister after Tony Blair took over in government. We had a consensus between the main parties over what Britain should do strategically about our energy. We agreed that we would have much more nuclear energy, far more renewable energy. We would decrease our reliance on carbon. That was 25 years ago. Successive governments did virtually nothing about it. They left it to the private sector. The private sector has done very nicely out of it, as they are right now, in their profits uh, on uh, oil and gas. But there are other issues too, like universal credit, taxation, poverty. Poverty has never been greater in this country in my lifetime. Check the statistics. So, we're all European. We're European <coughs> by our geography, by our politics of being a pluralist democracy, by our historical heritage, our culture, our law and legal systems, though even within the United Kingdom, of course, Scotland still has a basis of Roman law, which is different from English common law. And we share values, and that is probably the most important and deepest. And my message tonight is to say, just put these statistics on one side. It's the ideas that matter. Ideas always win. That is the biggest lesson of history, I believe. And it's a matter of winning because of our hearts and minds and what we really think. There is another factor, a thing that has created Western Europe over the last 2,000 years, really, has been Christendom. Uh, and that is a shared faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Whether you are uh, an Eastern Orthodox Christian in Ukraine or in Russia, or whether you're a Protestant or a Roman Catholic in Western Northwest Europe, uh, it is the moral basis of our life and our society, of our families and how we behave as individuals. That has shaped Europe too. And all of us have big ideas by which we live. Let me just tell you what were my two big ideas. On my 10th birthday in 1955, my parents said, we've got a surprise. I'd already agreed we'd have a picnic on a barrow on Cranbourne Chess. That's what I wanted for my lunch. They took me over to the cathedral and we met the librarian, Dr. Elsie Smith, a very frightening and formidable academic, always wore black with a big black hat. She took my hand and she and I went up those stone stairs into the library. She went over to a rusty old safe and she opened it and she said, hold up your arms. 
<coughs> and onto my arms she put a delicate old little parchment I couldn't read. And she looked me in the eye. And she said, one day you'll remember that on your 10th birthday, you held the Magna Carta in your hands. <laughs> Wouldn't do it today. <laughs> How did I ever forget that? The second was only three weeks later. I was a little boy playing on Swanage Beach on a Friday afternoon with about 20 other ten-year-olds. We were digging the sandcastles, making lovely sandcastles, and uh, my friend Richard and I, he was from Bishop's Row, and then Walmsley, we were digging a lovely castle right down by the sea. There was another circle of our friends who were digging a bigger, better sand castle further up the beach, about 30 yards away. And they said, come and see what we found. And they, they got a metal tin. And one of the boys had a metal shoehorn. He went trying to open it. We got very bored. So Richard and I went back to our little sand castle. There was a huge explosion. I was blown into the sea. Richard was full of shrapnel. Five little boys were dead. From a British landmine on a British beach, ten years after the end of war. So those have guided me. One about the futility of war in Europe. What is it for? And the other about the importance of our constitutional arrangements, which say that it's the citizens who say what the state can do, and what are the limits of state power, and where is justice where is social justice? Where is the system of justice? And those two big ideas have driven my life. And I commend them to you. So, another thing that I think we should touch on. Why was the European Union invented in the first place? Well, I'm sufficiently <laughs> of course to remember what it was like in Salisbury after 1945, when the place was a garrison town, it was absolutely flooded with uniformed soldiers, particularly. Um, and uh, it was really important to remember uh, that we had won the war against Nazism. Now we had to learn to win the peace. What were we going to do about our smashed economies, our bombed cities, <coughs> our crashed up transport systems, employment? What about food rationing? 1945, the United States stopped feeding us. They just cut off supplies. That's why we were on food rationing here till 1953, actually 54, until the final food came off rationing. So we had to learn to live with the consequences. And of course, the European Coal and Steel Community was one of the first things on which we agreed. We agreed on the United Nations and the Charter of the United Nations. We agreed on the establishment of NATO. And we agreed that we must have some sort of way of bringing the nations together <coughs> so that we would not only win the war, but win, defeat the causes of war. And that's what we tried to do with the European Union. It was first and foremost about <coughs> peace in Europe. That was, that was the, the first point. How on earth could we ever find ourselves fighting Germans and Italians in our small continent? So it was about peace, it was about economies and growth and making sure that we could improve our economies and trade internationally and it was also about what now we would call levelling up across Europe from the very poorest economies which were nearly all in the south of Europe, Spain, Italy, Greece, as opposed to the richer economies in the north. And could we find a way in lessening tension, lessening the likelihood of war, if we could only level up across? And that was the third pillar of the original EU and why we wanted to do it. And so now we have 27 nations, should be 28. Interestingly, the whole of the European Commission, looking after 27 nations, employs just over 60,000 civil servants. The United Kingdom, with four nations, employs 
473,000 officials. <laughs> so don't let anyone tell you that the EU is a bureaucracy that is completely out of control. And that perhaps we are, but it's certainly not them. I think one of the other things I really want to impress upon you is the EU has been an outstanding success, a huge success over the years. After all, it is a union of independent nations. I don't think I've noticed that the French are less French, or the Germans less German, or the Italians less Italian. Far from it. We seem far more confident about expressing our nationality now than we did in my childhood. 500 million people, that's 10% of the population of the Earth, are in the European Union. And the European Union is the third largest economy in the world after the USA and China. Why on earth did we leave? The EU is evolving, it is expanding. The United Kingdom is, in my view, slipping backwards into isolation. Ukraine, Moldova, Finland, and Georgia have applied to join the EU. Ukraine, Moldova, Finland, Sweden, Georgia are all uh, trying to join NATO. And they're doing it voluntarily, no one's telling them. They're doing it because they want to, because they believe in our values. We are, however, facing now a new world order. Everything's changed, even in five years. We are thinking afresh about China, and their place in the world, that's why we must keep the, the international waterways open. The Spratly Islands, 40 years ago we were saying that's where there'll be trouble and how right it was. And that's why it's right that the Royal Navy is sailing the waters of the South China Sea and everywhere else. The Asian tiger economies are growing very fast. India is growing very fast indeed. All the Pacific countries are growing faster than the Atlantic economies. Africa is starting to grow from a very low base. And then there's Russia. Too difficult to say where that will go, isn't it? But when Russia decided to take on Ukraine, I don't think they, they realised they were taking on the world. And that's why it's been so incredibly significant that we have a united response right across the world. Mr. Putin says it's economic warfare. Yeah, that's right, it is. But that's preferable to bombing hospitals and child hospitals at that. I've always had a little theory, and I dare say that Olga will put me right, I, um, I've done a lot of lecturing since I retired, and um, I do lectures on things like Vikings. And in the course of that, I learned a lot that I really didn't understand before about what Russia meant the word. What, what is it about? It's about Scandinavians, Vikings, coming rowing, the land of the rowers, Russia. But there was something else. The Vikings were on their way to Constantinople, the Black Sea. And I think, um, I think Mr. Putin is terribly jealous because Moscow was founded in 1147. Kiev was founded by the Vikings in 482. <laughs> I don't think he likes it a bit. And as for him rewriting Ukrainian history, that Okay. Uh, that was absolutely astonishing. So what's the UK going to do? Well, the first thing that's going to have to happen after our exhausted government takes a break is that we've got to start healing divisions. And we've all got a role in that because we can stop arguing about what happened six years ago. There is massive division in our country between the nations, with the union itself at risk, 
Parliament is deeply divided by the old British tribal politics, which I believe has had its day. I know I'm out of it now, and I was part of it. I know I was. But I can now see how damaging it is to our country that we have this ridiculous first-past-the-post system designed <laughs> Signed after the 1832 Great Reform Act uh, by Disraeli uh, in order to bring some sort of shape and order to British politics. And it worked, it worked very well until about 25, 30 years ago. So Parliament needs reform, uh, our whole democracy needs reform, we need to stand the whole thing on its head, in my view, and we have to start saying, stop all this winner-takes-all nonsense, which just divides us. There are only two countries in Europe that use first past the post, us and Belarus. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's time for us to actually join the family of Europe when it comes to how we vote on our politicians. It's divided our local councils. It's divided Wiltshire Council. It's divided Salford City Council. And it's completely not necessary. It doesn't have to be like that. So what I'm looking forward to is a new Britain and a new EU, responding to new circumstances. And then there's NATO. Well, we find ourselves in an extraordinary situation. In spite of the well-intentioned actions of the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary and others, going around Europe, doing their best to try and get a united front on Ukraine, we aren't at the top table. We're no better off than we, are, we were when uh, Britain in the 1950s was described as a nation that had lost an empire and not yet find a role. We're back there. But it's one thing we have. We have the strongest military forces in Europe. There's no question about and that's why NATO is so important, and why our role in NATO is so important. And why NATO has got to change. NATO does an incredible job. I don't very often respond to postings on Facebook, but I did yesterday. Because someone said NATO is sitting there twiddling their thumbs while all this is going on in the Ukraine. No. All three of our forces, and the forces of all the NATO countries, are working flat out to defend the next dominoes in, the, in Putin's pile. They're there to ensure that he doesn't set foot in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Finland, Georgia, Moldova, all of those countries. And that is something that NATO can do. The Royal Navy has a particular issue in safeguarding our communications with all the undersea cables, all the fiber optic cables now, uh, on which the whole world depends. And some of you may have seen that uh, television documentary, well, it wasn't a documentary, it was a, it was a play um, about submarines a few, few months ago. Um, not far off the mark, actually, with what's happening in terms of tracking Russian attempts to know exactly where our cables are and how to cut them. So, it's true that we have the strongest forces in NATO. I happen to believe that they are the best led. I have terrific confidence in the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Radikin, and in the three other service chiefs. I'll tell you why, I better, I better declare an interest here. My little nephew, Ben, who well, I've known since the day he was born, his first seaboard and chief of the, of the Navy staff. <laughs> uh, so I, I have great confidence um, in him as, as a military leader. Uh, and, but I do in all the chiefs as well. And I salute our military. Uh, they've done us proud for a couple of hundred years actually. But they have such a future. And they spend such a lot of time thinking about the future. And that's what we've got to do too. 
we have got to look to a new future. We have to set a new agenda for our country. And that will not be rejoining the EU because the EU is changing itself. We'll have a relationship with the EU. We have to spend our energy working out what that relation will be. I happen to agree with Lord Heseltine and the European movement uh, in saying that we should seek perhaps to join the single market as a first step. Who knows? But let's just put behind us those six-year-old arguments for six-year-olds and concentrate on building a new future for the country, for Europe, for NATO, for, for the whole Western world and democracy with people who believe in values, their freedom, the rule of law, social justice, all those great ideals. That's really what we've got to do. That's the new challenge, not just the country has, you and I, each of us have that challenge to be a positive part of a new Britain in a new Europe, in a new world order. We have to make sure that what comes next, given the apparent crumbling of the rules-based international order that we've lived with since the Second World War, and we have to do better. Are you with me? Do you agree? <laughs>
ready for 10 days ago. Time just flies. The about 700 people supported in the stadium for us. So children have to know. They don't need to know everything, but they have to be yes. aware. Yeah. Olga, you said to me before we met that um, you have a friend in Moscow. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us what your Moscow friend thinks about it? Oh, that's hard. Because actually uh, we know each other for a long time and we always feel like we are brothers and sisters. We never had any issues between us. And of course when everything started, she called me first. And they were so busy, so concentrate on their health. And I just couldn't pick up the phone and said, oh, I'm so sorry, not now. But she can hear my voice just slow down. And she couldn't understand it, to be honest. Then she tried to contact me again. And she sent me the message, Olga, what happened? Are you okay? How is your business? And how she can ask about my business? And she called some colleagues in Kharkiv. And again, she asked them, oh, how are you? How are you going? And I said, oh, we are in a shelter. So people live in the darkness. And later when I finally talked to her, I said, it's nothing personal, it's just what happened in our life. And again, she said, what do you mean? That's just military objects. I said, no, you live in the bubble, darling. And when I explained, when I sent the pictures, she said, no, 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 it's not gonna happen. But you know what, today she sent me the message and she told me, I'm so sorry, I feel sorry for my country. And people actually can see something happening. They start to realize that they want to say something. And I'm glad at least she knows and my other close friend from the childhood began to think, yeah, we probably understand, but we can't just come outside and talk lively about it. We can't stop it. And everybody seems quite selfish. We still think, no, 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 it's somewhere in Ukraine, on Ukrainian territory. But I really wish them to know because it was sort of shocking <coughs> how people can live in that cage without actually cage, but they even don't aware what happened. Whole world stay behind Ukraine and they don't even know. They still don't know what happened to that young soldiers who Russia sent to die. I'm sorry for saying that that's what happened. They just leave people there and Ukrainian soldiers pick them up, take them to the hospital. They actually have report who is in, on the Ukrainian territory, at least <coughs> parents can know. But Russia, I, I just feel sorry, honestly, I feel sorry for people because it looks like they live in a different world. And some of them not aware why price is going up, why Facebook or TikTok doesn't work. So they just isolated from all this news. And even now I told you, what is on your news? Because of course, you know, Russia not so sure now, but she don't know, actually it's just news around the country, news about Russia, what happened inside of the country. So they're just really isolated from, not just Europe, isolated from the whole world. And I, I feel sorry, and I feel sad, and I feel scared, and I, I don't even know what to think about. But I know somebody, in Russia, cry for us now. Somebody understand us now. And pray for peace as well, like we do. Thank you, Robert. Well, I, I, I have another question, because we were talking just at the beginning, and uh, as, as we all know that um, Ukrainians and Russians have friends and relatives either side of the border, and historically have never been a big issue, as far as anybody knows anyway. And you, you, you said to me that actually, present business and Putin's behaviour and so on is, 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 is giving Ukrainians, whether they're Russian speakers or Ukrainian speakers or anything else, a greater sense of, of, of national identity. Is this correct? Is this a kind of backfiring of Putin's intentions? Uh, I think Putin he will be in the history of the Ukrainian nation because he's a guy who welded together yeah. different parts of the country. Because Ukraine is a huge part of huge country and they've got some culture culture from Osman Empire, Austrian Empire, from Poland Kingdom, from Russian Empire, and it's all been back together only hundred years ago, eighty years ago. 
and now finally he just welded all together and all the people now doesn't matter which language you speak doesn't matter who you are like our president we are Jewish we got some old nation you know like in my when my childhood in the Dnipro city we got about eight churches in one street and no one cared absolutely half the people was atheist they love communist party some people going to catholic church some orthodox church another church another, another. no one cared about them. it was like nice society but it was with identity like ukrainian some western said we should be ukrainian like this and on the eastern part they said we should be ukrainian like this but for the last two weeks it's a new core becoming it's a it's a people they fight for their land like this guy who done delivery for us who went there in AIDS, he just came, oh I bought for me bulletproof, I bought for me cask and equipment, I was going to uh, join territorial army. And we just say like, wow, we just every single friend like my dad, he's 65, and they support the local army, they just dig in the trenches, doing some equipment just to protect the road if tanks go in there, and every single person in the village, they never, they never ever was so united, like in this very tough time. It's a horrible time. When you wake up in the morning at 5 o'clock and your mom sends you a message, we go, the war, bombing started, it just, you couldn't believe it. Still now, after four, two weeks, I don't believe it. Because my one granddad lived in the Russian <coughs> side. Some relatives that live there, some there, we never split people. In Ukraine, never make the line like you're first class, second class. Mm -hmm. It's like we train with very nice people and they more closer to Western culture. Yeah. With all the rights, all the because Ukrainians they never had only one president who re-elected twice. Mm -hmm. Because we don't like some tyrant, we don't like some dictators. <laughs> always push them away. We all like be like in Europe with democracy without a strong leader who will show them what to do. So I mean um, my uh, Ukrainian student years ago asked me a question um, from a point of anxiety about the way the country was after the collapse of the Soviet economy. Um, he said what European country uh, do you think we will end up more like Will we be like Britain? I didn't quite agree with that. I, I gave another suggestion, but from what you said, I'm wondering, looking forward for Ukraine, which which model for a European country would you, you like perhaps to be? When I was a kid, yep. and I was six years old, and I went to the first demonstration in Zaporozhye when Ukraine started fighting for independence mm -hmm. and Soviet Union collapse. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the strongest economy in Europe. Like, I knew the guys who work in the rocket industry and produce the space mission, you know, and all the equipment, crazy stuff. And it's the most developing country in energy production, most nuclear power stations. It was like very strong, powerful economy. But for the 30 years, now it's a blank page. And I would like to say it will be a strong agriculture country with high tech technology and renewable energy, yeah. which can very easily build huge amount of solar panels, wind stations, and we produce only 55% of the <coughs> power stations produce it, and 20% by hydropower station. Just it's, it's a very nice country. We got some heavy industry still alive. But if our people have the same law, same rules for every individual who can develop their business and build it, all Ukrainian people for five, ten years they will build a new country. Yeah. If they've got possibility for that. Because now in Ukraine preference, like months ago, two months ago, it was for the big corporation. Mm -hmm. They got a huge tax. Cutting off and everything, but small businesses they have no chance to <coughs> develop. But I think, like, if you start from the blunt page, the small business should build a country, like, for example, in 
France, agricultural country, with a nice economy, strong industry and agriculture. And this year, Ukraine, they done more than 20% of all production of grains. Oh, yes. And sell the market. Can you imagine next year if this doesn't happen? It will be a disaster for all the African country and India, China, buying the grains from. Oh, I just think, you know, you were coming back to just people, you know, and our families. <coughs> Even when we talked to our family and friends two weeks ago, of course everybody was so terrified. They couldn't believe, they've been so scared. But now actually people start to think positive and even when I talked to my parents, they said, no, no, we will stay here, we will fight for our homeland and we will rebuild our country and which they're just so sure they want to be there. And my friends who dream to live abroad, they say, no, 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 we want to stay with Ukraine, we want to help to stand up and we want to see like new, strong country. Sometimes I even think probably it's happened for some reason. Of course, I can't find the answer why people die and why children die. It's something that's not coming from my heart and my head. But probably that's actually a chance for Ukraine to change. Because never ever my country was so united, so strong, so patriotic. And never people believe into Ukraine like they believe now. And that's why that's a really good time to change, not step back, step back and stay with Russia. Just go forward and build a new country, hopefully. I spoke with some length about the importance of values in life. Yeah. And is that something that attracts you about the European Union? That we are a community, or were a community, of na individual nations who all believe the same basic values. But everybody can see how Ukrainian people bravely fight for freedom, for democracy, and that's the most important values of the European Union as well. And I think we prove it every single day with our lives, with our power, and with our believing into freedom, <coughs> into these Western values. Okay. Um, well, look, I, 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 I just give a round of applause, please, to Olga. Thank you. 
for what well, clearly Ukraine won't be able to afford when it comes to rebuilding. Very good question. Who's going to take that one? Well, I'm happy to start. Well, okay. uh, <coughs> the answer is yes. Uh, we had the amazing support of the United States in Europe after the Second World War, which really got us out of trouble and helped us all to rebuild our economies, of whichever side of the battle we've been on. Um, and we could do the same again. We have created institutions like the World Bank, for example, who can facilitate this. If you consider the speed with which the world economy shut out Russia in the last two weeks, it was astonishing. I've never known such unanimity in the financial sector right around the world. They can open it up again. We can find new ways of financing. An awful lot of Russian assets sitting overseas in banks. Um, and reparations might well be the order of the day. Um, because I, I am sure that uh, Putin will not win. Because I do not believe the Russian people want him to win a battle against Ukraine. So we have the financial muscle to do it, we have the will to achieve it, and we know that Ukraine wants to be a new country. So I, I, can, I may be the eternal optimist, I am, but I believe it will work. Well, thank you for that. Um, anybody here a Chelsea supporter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have um, another question over here, please. Okay, Rob, uh, back to Brexit. Brave New 22 to uh, um, Reform Act. Would you have a written constitution on this? So, what would be the main points? No, I wouldn't have a written constitution. I believe our constitution is perfectly good. It would help if we had a government that would respect it. <laughs> that would be a change. Yeah, yeah. I also believe very strongly that uh, the four component nations of the United Kingdom have different problems and different solutions depending on their nationhood. Uh, that can be a great strength. If you were to put that within the straitjacket um, of a written constitution and, a, and worse, a codified <coughs> legal system, I, I don't think that would be helpful. So uh, I, I hope that we will not have a written constitution. I, I don't actually think it would help. Um, I am sure, however, you can create an awful lot of jobs in the civil service. Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, I think there's one over here, please. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> the camera. Given just what a massive uh, thing coming out of the single market was, why do you think there hasn't been sufficient clarity around the benefits, not least to obviously the Northern Ireland situation, but the, the one thing, I had five years in import-export, so I understand the detail, but uh, when you think of the extra costs, you know, the, the civil servants you were talking about, you know, the extra people that have got to do paperwork, all the costs that's going to be ramped into everything we buy, because obviously those salaries are going to be paid for, and the extra time delay, etc. I don't understand why the opposition or those that are against it aren't actually making a very clear, concise, understandable reason why coming out of the single market was a bloody stupid thing to do. <laughs> of course it was. Uh, there, it, there it was. 500 million people, our biggest market, 20 miles away <coughs> with a tunnel if you didn't like the ships, and airports all over the place, free movement of people. Free movement of scientists and academics um, and plumbers. Um, it was a fantastic and idea. <laughs> um, and, and apparently, we're all meant to clap loudly uh, because we have a, 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 new, uh, a new arrangement with the Faroe Islands. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I'm awfully cynical in my old age. But no, I mean, it, it, it defies belief that anyone could actually have voted to do that. We have to gently explain, of course, but I think they're seeing things unravelling. Um, I think <coughs> uh, 
the cost to small businesses in particular of exporting is now so great they're stopping. Uh, the big corporations are relocating. The City of London is now losing out to Copenhagen and Frankfurt and Paris. We still have a, a, a massive command of world financial interests. But the bread and butter stuff, insurance industry, for example, I am told, um, is, is moving out of London as fast as they can. Uh, it, we need to get back in there. One way or another, it is done. It was a, a treaty that uh, the current government negotiated. They knew what they were signing. As soon as they signed it, they started talking about breaking it. Um, and that, of course, is the story of the Northern Ireland Protocol at large. So we have to be patient. Let's not get into the trap of rerunning the arguments of six years ago. Uh, but let's just say, if, if you like, told me so. <laughs> okay, um, is that another question? Okay, the lady? Oh, sorry, the, back here, the, the lady at the front. Yeah. Sort itself out. They have been part of the trauma. 
because we've seen too often that real journalism has been squeezed out. If the newspaper and <coughs> television and radio channels don't like a journalist, like Ms. Kat Wallader, or one or two others, um, they are frozen out. Peter O'Born is an example, frozen out by all the big press and media. Uh, and there are others too uh, who are in that boat. So we need to just get this square and we need to get the freedom of good journalism back into our mainstream because British journalism has a proud record of accurate reporting and investigative reporting. That should be the norm. I, I actually remember one hundreds of years ago when I was a minister responsible for broadcasting and I had to prepare all the papers to go to cabinet because it was the, the ten year review of the BBC charter. And there were various options open uh, because as now they don't much like the BBC. And they said oh, they're all lefties and pinkos and woke <laughs> and all the rest. Well, it, nothing's changed very much. But actually, I'm delighted to say that the cabinet, without any prompting from anybody, least of all me, just threw it out and said, no, of course not. It's horrible. It's painful as a politician to have the BBC as a free and independent body. But that is absolutely essential. So I think that those are two areas in which I start. Thank you, Robert. Claire, do um, Robert, what would you see as being the roadmap for rejoining the EU? What do you think will, you know, using a crystal ball, what do you think the stages might be? Well, I think stage one is already happening. And it's the Ukraine war that uh, is stimulating it. <coughs> because it's making us, it's challenging us with all our relationships, with all our international obligations and international bodies, whether it's the EU or NATO, the Western European Union, or the Atlantic Council, bodies you may have never heard of, but which are actually rather important to encourage all these things. Um, and we have got, as I said, we, we have to start again. We can't just do nothing and pretend, oh, it's, everything's going to be all right. It's not. But that is also happening across Europe, in all the European countries. And if we get countries like Finland and Sweden joining NATO, not only will it infuriate the Russians, it will actually improve our own security. And so they're, they're being affected. The southern European states are being affected because of the economic outlook that they're facing. Um, and countries like Spain, for example, they have all the same tensions in Spain that we do about regionalization and self-government for Catalonia, for example. So we're all, we're all in this together. And that's, that's actually what liberal democracy is all about. It evolves. It is not something that's written down on a bit of paper forever. And, and long may that be. So there are lots of little ways we start. Personally, I would choose an attempt to reforge a relationship with the single market. Because I think that has been the single most damaging thing for our country. And we can do that simply by building alliances from the start, probably led by um, exporting industries, importing industries. Um, sorry, but next Christmas when there isn't any camembert to go with your stilts, that one really, really will move the industries. <laughs> I like it. Is there something over there? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. This is me. Um, sorry, it's not me. Adrian, I will terminate my remarks with a question mark. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm very interested in the very eloquent uh, presentation we've had about what's happening in Ukraine. And um, I was wondering what one could do to show one's direct support for what's happening in Ukraine. One can obviously contribute to charities, and they've done an amazing job of raising huge amounts of money very quickly, and that's excellent. What's missing is a sort of human-to-human -human contact, which I think is much appreciated and much needed by people in, in Ukraine. 
So I said that a very good idea that one thing you could do is acquire digital downloads, which is one thing we would find that which don't require a postal service to be delivered. And so in the last few days, I've actually put together a very large collection of art by children from Ukraine. Um, this is very valuable because children have a directness and an honesty and an eloquence, um, which is a very good antidote to the casuistry of Sergei Lavrov, for example. Um, now, I've spoken to the mayor, and we're planning to exhibit this in the Guild Hall in the next few days. So watch out for it. We're going to want to raise a lot of money for Ukrainian chari children's charities, and it will be coming very soon to a Guild Hall near you. Um, so my question is, is this not a worthwhile thing to do? <laughs>
is not allowed to use this cross in Ukraine. Because they said we are not here yet, because it's not safe. safe. So they're waiting for these yeah. corridors and they can come and give aid. But just, again, it's not what we know from the news, it's what we know from the first hand from people who Because I got a call there. from the driver about two or three hours ago. He left Salisbury on Sunday. On Sunday. On Sunday, yeah. And he just bring the old goods, 20 tons lorry directly to the hub where the volunteer is coming and they got like a parcel label for one volunteer to take stuff for Lugansk, some for Dnipro, some for there, some for there and just different but, directions. But if it will come, come to the hub on the border, it will on stay the there. Side, well, what stay there. people say is it's just no, not legal way to take it out. I, I can't it's to be honest, understand how days, if but, so many people in need still these um, paperwork or restrictions there, yeah. But I'm sure it will work very soon. But at the moment, <coughs> people suffering. People mm -hmm. suffering with essential stuff. And when I even pack all these nappies, and they could see we can fight with nappies now. It's just a lot, a lot of coming towards Poland, Poland and Ukraine. But at the same time, we talk to the doctors in the hospitals, and they just say, here are newborns, and that's our empty shelves. We have <coughs> no numbers at all, nothing. Yeah. And, and our friend, and our friend he, the brother of our friend, he lives in Dnipro, and now we send some money there, and she's going, he's going directly to the maternity ward and there, because some ladies <coughs> who is pregnant, they move out from the East part, and they don't have no relatives, no parents, nothing, because just with a little baby and your backpack, it's nothing. And he just done like three or four hospitals, but already transfer money, and he just go around the shops with his car, buy the stuff, bring it there, send the check, like, so every little help. Every little help. Every little help, yeah. Little help, yeah. <laughs> so that's how it works now. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes like 200 pounds, they can make a huge difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes it just, I think they need like 1500 to supply the fuel for lorry to drive through the Euro, through the channel. Yeah. It's a huge money. Now with that price going up, it's like over 2000 pounds. Mm -hmm. And you don't want this stuff, you collect it, all people gift it, make a nice great job and just stuck somewhere in between and mm -hmm. be lost. But, but it's just now, I, I really believe, you know, soon charities, when they are allowed to bring everything to all around Ukraine, it will make such a big difference. They're doing so well, they're doing well, but... I mean, the, the thing that, that occurs to me in all this, is actually, is the, the personal relationships that are being formed by this. We're talking about building back to a better Europe. I mean, it's horrible what's happening. We'd rather it be, be done by ordinary tourism or commercial exchanges or something, but it will forge, I, I hope, I trust, the personal Europe relationships right the way across Europe. Anyway, I understand there's somebody else. Oh, uh, yes. Um, yes. Really, I've been missing the point of Brexit. Brexit is typified by our attitude to Ukrainian refugees, surely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah. about simple yeah. life, it's about xenophobia. Excuses, but I've had time to think. I retired 12 years ago and I've observed it and I've travelled a lot in those 12 years. Uh, I think I've now visited every Scandinavian country, including Iceland. Um, and I, I can just see that we, got, we have got it wrong. And this, this strange idea that uh, 
To be a conservative, you have to have an ideology. It's something that's completely foreign to the Conservative Party. In, well, the Conservative Party I have belonged to for 50 years has had as its sort of cardinal belief, don't do ideology. Um, and that is why it was such a successful party for so long. And so I do think that the, the first past the post system polarizes absolutely everything. And what we've got to do is turn it right around. I'll probably be pushing up the daisies before it happens. But I don't mind that as long as it does. And it means that we, we've got to be much more interested in coalition government, which is regarded as rude in British politics to talk about coalitions. Coalitions are people who are like-minded from different political parties, different political views, who work together to see what the best solution is to any particular problem. And that's what we see in every other Western European liberal democracy, from Germany to Sweden. <laughs> Saying to people, we should join the single market, is the right way to go. I have a feeling that if we said, yes, there are other European countries who don't belong to the European Union, they agree with us, they have voted out, and those are the three richest companies, countries in Europe, I think there might be a much more receptive audience to that line of attack. Just a thought. Well, that's very good. And I, what I'm trying to suggest is we start a debate. And we can start it in Salisbury, if you like, um, about what sort of relationship we wish to forge. I have no blueprint that I wish to impose. Um, I think the single market is quite a sensible place to start. Um, but but I'm, there are many, many other areas of life, um, from education to health services, um, that are um, every bit as important as that. Uh, and I, I, I no longer buy the idea that winner takes all is a sensible way to run a country. What's the number one over here? Oh, yes, that's the thing. Uh, <coughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say that we, there's a lot of effort and money going into dividing us as a country. And um, we've had it with Brexit in a big way across the generations. And then actually with COVID, initially that looked like it might be quite unifying. Um, but it ended up being divisive as well with all the sort of online conspiracy theories and things that are being pushed. And this big disinformation machine, um, I, I don't think necessarily that the unity that we have at the moment on the situation on, in Ukraine will hold in this country. I can already see um, some tensions and, and splinters around the sort of narrative on that. And, in that context, how do we heal as a country, as, in, as Britain? How do we heal? How do we, heal? Yeah. we start talking about it. We start recognising where we've gone wrong. Uh, we start talking sensibly um, about our relationship with not only the European Union, but Britain of all countries, which has built up relationships all over the world from our former days of empire which kept us afloat for many, many years. Um, and I'm actually one of those old, silly old fogies who's quite proud of the British Empire and the legacy we've left behind. We knew when to get out. We knew when to give countries their independence, whether it was India in a very difficult way or a lot of other countries in a very good way a long time ago. So we could do it if we wish to as a, as a nation. It's interesting, I find, that Tonight, nobody has mentioned this. the biggest gift that Britain has given the world. Language. Our language. That is incredible if you think about it. That now, well, it's certainly the language of science and engineering globally, uh, and it's, it's the language of medicine, and in lots of other ways. Um, and, and that is something that we should build on. And that's a way in which we can actually influence things enormously. And 
hundreds of years ago when I was Minister of the Department of National Heritage, as was, um, I was astonished to discover at a ministerial meeting in Brussels, we had a discussion on minority languages. And so we discussed um, Irish, we discussed Welsh, we discussed Cornish. And then the German minister said, oh, but we're a minority language too. And of course he's right in global terms. German is not very widely spoken outside Germany. Okay, uh, could Geoffrey, uh, the chap behind, has been very, very uh, patient. Okay, yes. Quick question on the United Nations. They seem to have been remarkably ineffective in stopping this particular war in Ukraine. They did stop the civil war in Syria. So what are your suggestions, Robert, about making it a slightly more effective organisation? It will never be able to direct other nations to do things, particularly if it affects the members of the Security Council. Again, we have a massive advantage in being a member of the Security Council since the founding of NATO uh, because we have a nuclear deterrent, to put it in shorthand. Um, and so that's a great advantage. But it, it does mean that, for example, they, when they were discussing Ukraine and, and Russian invasion, Russia simply vetoed it. Said, no, we're not having a debate on that. We disagree. So th that is a problem. But, and it's a very big problem. But I would still much rather have the United Nations there with all its agencies, whether it's on refugees or UNESCO or whatever. It's been a great force for good and it's been hugely successful in spite of the problems caused by Security Council. <coughs> Um, if I may ask a question of Robert Keeley, I, I speak as someone who's only recently moved into Salisbury and when Brexit happened I was living in London and like most Londoners I voted very firmly for Remain and I thought it was a disaster when the result came through. That doesn't mean to say I think the European Union was perfect and I wonder if you could comment on what you think was some of the biggest difficulties facing the European Union, not just now but even earlier on then. Expansion is the biggest single problem. It was much easier when there were just six members before we joined um, and to make it work. It's now very difficult, which is why it's so important for new or candidate members to actually fully subscribe to the basic values of the European Union and, and uh, 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 democracy um, and the rule of law and all of that. So I think expansion is a big problem because it it, it presupposes massive changes in all our relationships uh, on a global basis. Not just with Russia, but with China, with India, with the Pacific Rim countries, all of them. Um, and if we're not very careful, it's very, going to be very easy for a coalition of interests to fragment at the edges. Uh, that's why we should be paying far more attention. I have that Britain has, over the years, been rather good at bringing nations together. Look at the Commonwealth. What an extraordinary, extraordinary idea. The Commonwealth of Nations. Second biggest thing uh, after the United Nations across the world. It just doesn't do anything, but it does create um, a cohesion of people of very widely different backgrounds and indeed of future prospects. So it's, it's a force for good. So the European Union, I think, growth is something that we have to, we have, to have our cleverest people really working hard on. Um, and amongst the people who are, in my experience, uh, cleverest, are a lot of people in the civil service in this country, <laughs> for whom I have a huge regard, not just because I got relatives in there, uh, but because I, I you know, hundreds of years ago when I was a junior minister, I recognised the way in which the civil service worked um, and uh, I, I have never been able to bear it when ministers of any party start slagging off their civil servants. It's, it's a wicked thing to do. I mean, we've seen it in number 10 recently. Um, so, uh, there we are. That's, that's what I think. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, well, I think Rick wants to. Well, I think we're coming close to 8.30 now, so um, I'm just wondering whether anyone on the panel would like to make any final remarks before we close the event. Older and Tata, would you, would you like to say anything else before we finish? We just can say thank you so much. Thank you for all your support. Thank you for <coughs> holding our hands, feeling for us, and thinking about Ukrainian people in this situation. And of course, thank you for this great uniting of different people and support from Salisbury, United Kingdom, and through all Europe. Thank you so much. And I always keep saying, we are stronger together. Yes. That's what they keep saying. <laughs> some capacity and all the rest of it. So could we give uh, Robert Key a large round of applause? <laughs>